Welcome to the latest in the Psyche Seminars series. The um, Department of Psychosocial and Psychoanalytic Studies, University of Essex. So we're thinking today about Hillman's paper on abandoning the child. Um, I think that, I mean, there's, it's packed full of stuff. So uh, I'm just going to highlight a few things that um, have uh, got my attention in particular without going into great deal of detail about them. And, um, and, and then we can have a general discussion. There are not so many of us, so I think we, we don't really need to um, raise hands or go into groups or anything. So. Um, so this um, reading Hillman um, this year has been very interesting for me because I, I run a study group and in the autumn we read a lot of Hillman and then after Christmas we were reading Bolas, uh, The Shadow of the Object and um, Bolas, Bolas's approach to the child is um, well very thorough, very impressive, but I find a bit claustrophobic. Um, absolutely, every tiny detail of the transference and countertransference is uh, tied down to um, some event in childhood, some aspect of the relationship with the parents. And um, he does, in, uh, in the shadow of the object, he does make a few kind of oblique uh, sort of gestures or references that, you know, there might be something beyond object relations, but he's, um, uh, he doesn't go there. He doesn't really say anything about it. Um, so, uh, for me, at this, I mean, Hillman is such a big contrast to that because he's he's talking about the child in a, in a completely different register. Um, I suppose I, I often think of therapy as a, a sort of quite a long, slow process of differentiating between the individual and the collective, sort of between myself and my family, or myself and my culture, and that that sort of individuation is this process of winnowing, if you like, <laughs> the, uh, the personal from the collective or from, um, from the larger. So this, I mean, this theme, of course, has been there from the beginning of psychoanalysis with ontogeny and phylogeny, that um, we don't really think in those terms now, but that, that uh, problematic in a way has always been there. Um, and it was, you know, used in the kind of Freud-Jung debates as a way of, of, as a kind of cudgel. But I mean, in, in, uh, in Freud, there's a lot of uh, phylogeny. So it isn't a really a clear cut thing that Freud is ontogeny and Jung phylogeny it doesn't really pan out like that. Um, so the, some of the themes from this uh, chapter that really struck me, so one was the, the difference between the mother and the nurse, that um, uh, where he talks about, you know, for the mother, it's a question of life and death, and for the nurse, it's not. Um, and, and it has often struck me as, I'm, perhaps this is particular to London, I don't know about other parts of the world, but that the analysts are, are very preoccupied with the mother transference. And um, that so that's, you sometimes get the feeling that that's really the only thing they're focusing on, only thing they're interested in. Um, but this idea of a nurse is, I thought quite salutary and quite helpful that you can attend to wounds, you can attend to suffering, without assuming the kind of um, mantle of the mother, if you like. Another theme that I liked in this chapter is the, is the notion of burying the child, 
that the child is not there to be fixed or um, improved, but the child is just always there. And, and part of being an adult is bearing the child part in oneself or the child dimension in one's experience. And that this, it, that dimension in, this, in essence doesn't change. It's always there. And of course, this is one thing people complain about in therapy. You know, I've been coming here all these years and I haven't changed. There, you know, obviously, I guess it's obvious to me, but maybe not to them, <laughs> that there will be parts of them that don't change. Right? And um, that uh, they just are there and, and are part of their, if you like, their fate or their uh, life story. And uh, they'll, they'll run into it again and again over time. Um, another theme he mentioned, which I thought was very interesting, was about movement. And that's on page 28. Um, Right, so um, sorry, he's talking about the idea of growth and how you know psychotherapy is brought bought into the notions of development and growth and so on. Um, and he, he says growth like evolution and development or like any of the pregnant terms with which psychology operates, unconscious soul self is a symbolic emotionally charged word evocative rather than descriptive, generally, generally hortatory rather than particularly precise. We have confused the general category of motion with one of its varieties, so that all movements and changes become witness to growth. We call adaptation growth and even suffering and loss part of growing, we are urged, nay expected, to keep growing in one way or another right into the coffin. So then he gives um, this one idea of psychology. He gives then a list of various impl implications of it. Um, but I did uh, like this sort of invitation to think about motion in psyche, motion in living. <laughs> Um, not just in terms of growth or improvement or development, that motion might have other implications. Um, but, uh, then finally, the um, uh, thing, one other thing that struck me was where he talks about Aristotle, Leibniz and Jung. Um, and this idea that there is something there that he doesn't say necessarily it's a given, but it, it, it isn't, um, uh, it's independent in some way. So in, in Aristotle, he's pointing to intellecti and Leibniz to the monad and Jung the self. Um, and I suppose for me, it, individuation is ultimately something to do with singularity, that it's your own singularity becomes, um, uh, comes into play and becomes visible in some sense to yourself or to others. And uh, that seemed to echo with, with that uh, point he was making there. So those are just a few of the things that um, that caught my attention. I'm sure, I don't know quite what, what kinds of responses you've had. Um, feel free to lump, jump in. Everybody's quiet, so maybe I'll jump in. Uh, hello, David. Yeah. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. 
Okay, so uh, when I was reading this, uh, uh, yeah, first of all, it's a really good text and I really liked it. And I liked, uh, you know, this uh, uh, questioning, what do we uh, uh, perceive as a child, you know, or what are the cultural norms, what a child is and how it needs to be bettered and growth and all this. But also when I was reading this, uh, one older uh, story and uh, interest of mine uh, popped up uh, 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 which is a story of uh, Kaspar Hauser, and I don't know if you guys uh, know it or if anyone read anything about it, but it's actually about a child who was living in a complete darkness in some kind of a basement. And do, do, does anyone uh, know uh, the story of Kaspar Hauser? Because it's a real uh, historical uh, story. Tell us. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be short. Uh, so basically, in Germany in uh, 18th century, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one child appeared in a market square and no one knew where that child came from. And uh, the child could barely speak and was not uh, uh, social at all. And then uh, they tried to socialize him and uh, work with him. And he was really clever and intelligent and picked up on uh, all things immediately. But because he was living all these years, like 12 years or something in a complete darkness and he was fat and but he didn't have any human interaction. He just had a, a horse, a wooden horse toy. And he kept repeating when he was found, I want to be a, a, a ritter, which means like a knight or a rider or, a, you know, horseman like my father was. And that was the only thing he could speak. Uh, and because he was living in darkness, uh, he had extremely sensitive sense of sight and smell. Uh, so when he was first offered uh, meat, for example, he fainted uh, and he could smell uh, things from, you know, hundreds of meters away, like a dog or something. Yeah? And then uh, that child, uh, uh, when he was growing up in that city and kind of municipality, I think, uh, took care of him. Uh, he was invited to some uh, water fountain in a park by someone. We don't know historically who that person was. And that at that fountain, he met that person and he was stabbed to death. And uh, it's a very interesting story. Uh, you know, how a child develops when he's taken out of society or of care or nursing, what you were mentioning before. Uh, and also, you know, what we conceive as a, uh, uh, natural abilities and what happens if they are isolated but also with this story of course uh, all sorts of speculations popped up uh, later uh, if he was a illegitimate uh, child of some uh, person from court and then he has to be eliminated because he was heir of a throne of some uh, you know uh, like saxony or something uh, uh, so there are all sorts of uh, undiscovered things about his fate and about his uh, 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 origins. But still, uh, that story of this child uh, taken out of society, placed into some hole, and then he uh, reappeared and how he reintegrated and uh, so on. Uh, I, uh, it, uh, I reminded uh, uh, when I was reading this, uh, it came to me uh, back because uh, when I was a student of art, this story was quite important uh, to me. Eh? Uh, so yeah, that's just maybe to kick things off here. Well, I often think about, you know, what Hillman's saying when, I mean, trauma is like uh, the big topic right? <laughs> these days. Um, and uh, I, I often, I mean, in a way, um, Hillman seems to, part of what he's saying is, you know, to be a child is to be traumatized. It's not, um, uh, it, it comes with the territory right? that uh, 
And um, I wonder, you know, if, if one looked at it that way, um, how that might affect how we think about our client's experience and how we speak with them. And um, that, um, yes, it, it was traumatic, um, but it's not, um, uh, I mean, trauma, there's some, obviously there's all the kinds of degrees, but we, we do think of trauma as being sort of um, a bad thing basically, <laughs> rather than an inevitable thing. Um, I mean, I don't know how much uh, Reynolds's whole thing about, you know, um, thinking about the growth potential in, uh, in, in trauma, in migration, and so on, in war experiences, is related to that sort of idea, that um, these are things that uh, I guess you could say, well, if they're not too damaging, you know, because they could be too damaging. But um, okay. I suppose it resonates a bit with what Hillman says in the book on war that, that um, you know, that war is normal. Right? So, in some way, uh, being a traumatized kid is sort of normal. Um, it's not. Uh, it's not surprising. I, I think maybe, maybe that was a too heavy start. Uh, sorry, John, uh, but uh, I remembered. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Jung's uh, uh, talks about, uh, you know, how to keep uh, inner child alive and how it feeds creativity and how he was playing on the beach with those pebbles and carving stone and, and how uh, uh, childhood uh, attitude or mentality can be really helpful in a creative process. So that's a more positive aspect to this story, what we are talking today, maybe. Uh, so, sorry, John. Yeah. That's fine, Zora. Um, well, let's go on the premise that every child, by definition, would have to undergo some type of developmental trauma throughout their lifetime. And even like, let's say, in the nearly 30 years of my practice, I don't think I ever encountered a, a client or a patient who didn't have some degree of suffering. Um, that affected them developmentally on some level, even though it would hardly be considered to be paralyzing like, um, like PTSD or something like that. Um, even people who claim that um, they had a you know, perfect childhood, everything's fine. When you start getting into the weeds of things and their treatment, um, there's always something that, that you know, creeps out, slips out, um, seems to underlie, um, uh, you know, their psychic organization. Now, do we want to call everything traumatic um, or do we want to make differentiations in the notion that, that no matter what, we cannot escape from negativity in life and we are, you know, bombarded with the negative. And, um, in fact, you cannot not encounter the negative and, and be a human being. I mean, who's ever experienced that? Um, it's the way it is uh, internalized or experienced or revamped um, in one's own psyche that leads us even to the degree that so many people who have had developmental traumas are seeking the numinous and me included, uh, you know, we, you wouldn't be drawn particularly to Jungian thought um, if you weren't looking for some, something that we might not inappropriately call, call spiritual. Uh, now, whether or not one ever transcends one's traumas is another issue. 
Um, but, but I was struck by David's uh, opening around um, bolus uh, or basically classical psychoanalytic um, and object relations thinking that, um, you know, everything boils down to the transference uh, in one's individual, you know, experiences growing up with, let's say, mother, father, attachment figures, people like that, versus um, uh, Hillman or Jungian um, notion of the archetypal child. Um, I, I'd like to hear more about that, meaning more about what you mean by this abstract child out there that's uh, something we're supposed to be participating in that's independent of ontogeny. I'll stop there. Well, I guess, it, I mean, it's, it, it's uh, the idea that there is, I mean, it's about the sort of transpersonal or some kind of uh, cultural dimension or um, that, uh, you know, we, we have our own individual particular history and experience, but that's always in a larger context. And the larger context, um, includes uh, the child, the mother, the father, uh, many <laughs> different, uh, I don't want to call them figures, but many different uh, constellations, I guess, um, which have a historical um, reality and, and development and so on. And, and they're part of the, um, the world we live in or that part of the, the sea we're swimming in or whatever. So um, I think, it, you know, there's a problem if I am unable to clarify, you know, what's, what's particular to me and what's a kind of more general transpersonal or cultural or collective uh, state of mind. I mean, even in just like take the family, you know, the family has its own culture. Um, and I might, uh, it might take me a very long time to begin to clarify really my own self in relation to my parents. Um, that I've been, you know, I've, I've lived in a kind of a collective frame of mind. Um, and I think it's not so different with, with the child. There, the, the, there is a notion of the child. There is a history of the child. Um, and I think that's all very psychic and uh, affects us. All, you know, we're, we're part of it, we're in it. I don't think it's sort of out there somewhere. So, so the, the thing about the, the therapy is that I think it's helpful, at least for me, I find it helpful to bear in mind that the person's talking about their personal experience, but they're also uh, wrestling with the kind of the more existential or cultural aspect of something. So it's not just their own, I, like Bolas does actually in a very fine grained way, which is genius, <laughs> reduce all of the transference, counter transference to relation with the parents. Um, but to my mind, it, it, it becomes sort of uh, uh, boring in a way. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole lot more richness in life uh, than just what happened between me and my parents. So, so David, help me out with trying to understand this. Um, when, when the term 
and maybe it's just a can of transference to the term. When transpersonal is used, um, I'm thinking supernatural, but maybe that's just a bias. So um, if transpersonal is really just about our submersion in culture or a great, the greater collective of whatever that is, the community, um, the world, then that's not, I'm not hung up on that at all. I mean, of course we're thrown into culture. I mean, it's always the backdrop of everything that conditions our individual lives. Um, you cannot not have, uh, you know, social collectives that we weren't born into, uh, thrown into existence. Um, but it's almost as if there's some kind of reification of, um, of something that's supposed to, I guess, that's why I said existing out there that superimposes itself or supervenes on, on the individual psyche. I, just, I, I struggled with this for a while, so it's nothing I, I'm going to resolve. I mean, I don't think that transpersonal psychology has really much to do with the supernatural. It's, it's trying to think about these kind of collective structure, psychic <laughs> forms, right? Constellations. I don't think it's, um, I mean, I think some people are into supernatural, but I think transpersonal psychology as it developed and so on is not about the supernatural. Okay. It's about something more than the individual. Thanks for clarifying, Dave. Barbara, just go ahead. I, you don't need to raise. Okay. 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 Good. 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 Okay. Uh, I'll lower my hand. Yeah. Um, uh, I was lost in the uh, the team link that was sent, and more people are lost there. But uh, I hope they're finding their way. So I'm I'm not really up to um, going into discussion now. Um, could could you you know bring out what what um, what would make sense to talk about? Because I expected to, um, you know, to get some kind of thought for what everybody was thinking about in terms of Hillman's abandoned uh, child article. Well, we're just getting going. I mean, I don't know if there's some aspect that you okay. mixed okay. up you. Okay, so I could just go into that. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, there were numbers of uh, sections that I, I very, very much enjoyed and found, found helpful. Um, I think the, uh, the part where he's talking about the creative uh, child was particularly helpful uh, because uh, he's, as Hillman is very good at doing, he's bringing out all the different aspects you know, also the very negative <laughs> aspects. And uh, so I, I was very happy to, uh, I, I should get the article up so I could quote you some things, but that's off, just off the top of my head uh, at the moment. And it seems to be that it's uh, the, the article itself uh, is a very good uh, uh, ex um, introduction to how we um, go off into a limbo uh, over archetypes. So this happens to be the, the child, um, but I think he's uh, doing a very good job of, of showing uh, how we go off in all kinds of tangents um, in actually about the archetype. I suppose he does that somewhat toward the end where he's talking about history, right? Mm -hmm. um, so 
psychotherapy is an attempt also to revision history. Yeah. And it works in the complexes. Yes, that was super interesting. That yeah. Yeah. Lost again. He, he does, you know, they're following on uh, Jung's psychology is altogether a reflection of the historical psyche and not a program for its transcendence. Yes. That, um, yes. I think he does emphasize that a lot. The psyche is a historical. Yes. Um, I don't know, event <laughs> or reality. It's not outside of history, but there's a collective history. And, and I, the other section that I really liked was when he was talking about um, uh, the creation mythology that is um, uh, 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 being used. Um, and it's just, in fact, uh, just, uh, it doesn't say this exactly, but it's, um, you know, the, 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 the ideas um, are um, about the, the looking for the origin, yes, not creation, looking for the origin, and that, uh, that, the, that the scientists, uh, you know, as soon as they get onto that track of looking for origins, they 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 get bogged down into something nothing. They get something uh, um, totally uninteresting uh, for actually talking about the child. That's I thought was also very interesting. So now I'm going to shut up. <laughs> I don't. I I I'm trying just to hopefully be a part of this. I don't know how if it relates directly to what you're saying, but the, the notion of trying to find a cause. Um, and I was thinking about how a lot of Jungians use the idea of the shadow, that somehow they attribute almost all bad stuff to the shadow <laughs> um, or to difficulties with the shadow. Um, so I, I just at the moment I've been finding that rather unsatisfying. Um, I was thinking, well, maybe people are just, you know, nasty creatures. Right? And it's not, <laughs> it, it, the notion of the shadow doesn't really do much work uh, for understanding the, the violence and the evil people do. Um, that really maybe we need to, or I need to anyway, reimagine what consciousness is or what, you know, um, I suppose it, you know, it does go back to the, the, all the discussions about original sin and all that, but I mean, that what, uh, Is, is, the, is the problem actually in consciousness itself and not in the shadow? Yeah, it seems like that um, at least classical Jungians are more likely to wanna, you know, extricate themselves from the immediacy of lived conscious experience and go to the realm of the archetypal. Uh, the sh well, yeah, what do you mean by the shadow? I mean, uh, it it's, it's also seems like an excuse uh, to, as an explanation that's kind of sloppy. It doesn't really, it really doesn't get to the meat um, of, um, you know, one's aggressions or one's a dark side that they, have to take responsibility for and work through and see how it's connected to, let's say, those developmental traumas or, or other 
um, urges or, or impulses or desires that are unsavory and can't be channeled more um, appropriately. Um, I So just my reaction to both Barbara's introduction of that and then David's follow-up. I'd like to maybe respond that that um, the little paragraph before this chapter, Abandoned Child, started, I thought that Hillman said something that was also very crucial for this discussion. He said, uh, I'll, I, I want to um, bring imagination into a permanent place in consciousness, something like that. So that, to, to me, that, that's the, it, to me, it would be an answer about, well, what are we going to do with shadow? Um, well, we're going, to, we're going to make imagination have an, a permanent place in consciousness. That means, you know, you're also going to imagine all the bad stuff. So... <laughs> Well, that, that's, yeah, Barbara, that's good. I mean, this is where I would refer to that more to the realm of fantasy and fantasy is both conscious and unconscious. And um, if we look at how, especially in the history of, of, um, of philosophy, but particularly late modern to uh, continental, um, the notion of consciousness is always mediated by imagination. Imagination is the central faculty to the psyche, long before Hillman talked about this, um, and, and for uh, for that matter, Lacan. Yeah. But it's um, the fan the fantasizing of the other, or the external, or the internal, is uh, where the I think the meat of uh, the matter is. I'll give you a good example, especially about abandoning the child is the theme. So got a patient who um, was given up for adoption the first um, uh, six months of life. And then the mother changes her mind and takes that infant back. And the it's kind of a, a difficult situation because it was an illegitimate child by a, 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 you know, a man who was in and out of this woman's life. Uh, she still raises it. And uh, he's basically got two secret lives. So he's got his real family over here and he's got his, his squeeze and his son over here who he visits periodically over the years. The, the boys told uh, dad is a successful, you know, um, corporate salesman and he's always traveling. That's why you don't get to see him, da, 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 da. And he doesn't find out until his 20s, the real, the real truth. And the fixation he has is that he was abandoned at life and that's why he can't grow up. This is why he has all these uh, problems with being a perpetual uh, Peter Pan um, and, um, you know, growing up and taking responsibility, you'd rather just be like a little adolescent his whole life. But that's a retroactive fantasy. He never knew anything about his life until the 20s. But the, the notion that all of a sudden now he has that explanation that he was abandoned, he wasn't loved, he was given up. Who knows what happened to him over those six months when he was in some kind of other placement or foster care or in uh you know children's aid uh, you know society or whatever you call it when that seems to be an apra coup it's um uh, you know looking back and reconstructing things rather than experiencing um what happened um you know firsthand and, and we know that um you, the mind I mean, you don't have neural nets that are set down you know, that's why we don't have memories at the, at the age of uh, six months. They're just not prepared. Uh, 
So here's, this is a, fan, a narrative fantasy that he has, a cherished one about his life that defies in, in, empirical um, you know, evidence. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with uh, some parts of you, uh, John, but I also agree with lots of what uh, Barbara said, of course. Because uh, I think in this text, uh, what was uh, kind of jumping out to me is what we are projecting on a child and what uh, uh, purpose a child has in uh, adults' uh, uh, perception. You know, they are supposed to grow, they are supposed to develop, they, they are not perfect and they will evolve and so on. Yeah. So that's on one hand. And then if we look at uh, this uh, child uh, attribute, uh, the way he wrote was uh, uh, that uh, art or insanity or passion or despair, vision, those things we describe from adult standpoint of view as childish. Yeah? And then uh, what was really a good sentence for me was uh, that uh, whatever comes back uh, 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 points forward from the child archetype. Yeah? And that's what I also said for myself, uh, sometimes for art, for example, that I need to go way back, you know, to, I don't know, uh, early Middle Ages, before Renaissance, and then I can make some progress in the current practice or something. Yeah? So, so this connection with the past uh, through uh, archetype, uh, that was really uh, strong. But also this, you know, what we are all labeling a child with or what we are putting on a child as a burden, you know, what kind of function it needs to perform in a family and so on, what uh, David was talking. And uh, the big thing was also from this text, because uh, uh, when uh, I think it says, uh, like, if there's a, a couple, you know, and let's say that in this case, it's a traditional marriage, a man and a woman, it's not just two of them, you know, it's four of them, because everybody from them brings their inner child with them into the marriage. Yeah. So that was really important point uh, from this text for me. I, I wouldn't mind hearing more from you, David, because uh, I missed your, you know, your beginning. Uh, um, well, I'm not sure it's that important. Um, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I was just pointing out that in the study group I run, we had read Hillman, and then we read Bolas, and there was such a big contrast between how they dealt with the theme of the child. And that Bolas was uh, interpreting everything in the transference in a very fine-grained way into the relationship with the parents. And there wasn't any exterior <laughs> uh, image or um, to, to play that off against, if you like. Right. So, so if you in, in Hillman, you've got the individual personal experience, but that's always in the context or played off against the more collective or cultural uh, aspect. And I found that more interesting um, and not quite as claustrophobic as uh, Bolas's <laughs> approach. Um, so, um, and then the other thing, one of the other things I mentioned was I found his, his discussion of the mother and the nurse particularly interesting uh, in terms of psychotherapy, that many, many therapists seem to privilege the mother transference. Um, and uh, you rarely hear people talking about the nurse sort of transference or the nursing, the nursing aspect of being a therapist. And I thought the way he contrasted the nurse and the mother was very helpful as, as far as, you know, how to, how to go about therapy. That people come for nursing rather than mother. Yeah, 
Yeah, is that where the term sucks you dry comes from, David? I suppose. <laughs> But I thought also uh, uh, Hillman was saying that then we don't have to talk about the good and bad breast, uh, which is, I think, a great advantage too. Uh, when we're when we are being more the nurse. The one thing that struck me was that he said, for the mother, it's a question of life and death, and for the nurse, it's not. Um, but you get that feeling sometimes with, especially with sort of fairly new therapists, that it, there is a kind of, they have life and death anxiety about their patients and clients that somehow any little mistake they make is going to be sort of cause eternal damage to their soul. Um, but if they were trained more that, to be nurses rather than mothers, then uh, they might not feel quite so anxious about it. I suppose going back, one other thing that I thought was interesting was about motion, you know, because if you think of psychodynamic, dynamic means power and motion, doesn't it? So it's the, the, it's the motion and the power in the psyche. Um, and uh, motion is largely associated with libido. Um, and um, so in a way, in, well, depending what what your theory framework is, you know, you could say, well, the the, the driving motion is um, attachment or sexuality or something, but uh, Hillman just seems to be saying, well, there's so many ways of thinking about motion and movement. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm supposed to do a paper at a conference. Um, in August, I think it is, and I'm going to do it on the nomad, uh, nomad nomadology, which is like uh, Deleuze and Guattari, they talk about the nomad. So I've been thinking about, well, is no, something about the nomad, does that bring out some aspect of the psyche, you know, that, um, that these, uh, complexes or unconscious contents that there's some of them are sort of nomadic um, they can't be fixed in a kind of very predictable way um, and how, how if i think about it that way how would that be i mean because like if you think of cathect cathect is like occupying isn't it? it's a military term that you you go in and occupy. The Russians were trying to cathect Kiev and they didn't succeed. Um, but uh, it's, it's quite a fixed thing. It's an occupation. And Jung has the idea of possession that sort of some complex or uh, some archetypal thing possesses the ego. So there's some motion in that, that the, the ego, that the complex comes in so i just i like his idea that there's many ways of thinking about motion and we could you know what how how is it that things move right but that does resonate with the whole thing of psyche or anima animus what what animates the psyche how do things move in the psyche and i guess if uh in therapy if the therapist is not to attach to one particular notion of how things move, <laughs> but is sort of open that things can move in different ways, then that could be uh, free things up in some way. Not in, so you're not expecting that this will move to here, right? <laughs> I mean, this could go somewhere else entirely different. You don't know. 
I like the, the connection to the nomad. Uh, I have uh, a semi-nomadic people that I'm studying. <laughs> and they say very interesting things. Um, you know, they say, oh, you all say uh, um, East West home is best. We don't say that. We say it's best to be on the road. So I think, you know, uh, that kind of ties in with, with I, what I think Hillman does also, as you're mentioning very well, he's bringing in the multiplicity of views. May I suggest something about the relative nature of nomadism, which is that um, traditionally nomads, uh, they don't inhabit a house, but they inhabit an area that they tend to know very well. They've been living there, living there for generations. They know every creek and every hilltop. So in the sense that it looks a lot like home to them. Oh, it's only a bit less located, if you want. So that, that sort of preserves the notion of um, um, familiarity and belonging. There is some modern nomads like uh, refugees that are in a very, very different position from traditional nomadic people. Yeah, I mean, lots of, the no, lots of nomads have quite a, a defined uh, circuit, don't they? That they, go to, they go here and then they go there. Um, but I suppose you could think of therapy as, as discovering your own nomadic territory, your own nomadic circuit, but uh, not being too fixed on uh, who you thought you are or whatever. The other thing perhaps is that consciousness itself as being as a kind of freedom that alienates one from the immediate embeddedness in um, uh, life of impulses, like an animal would experience, is in fact already a prim primordial uh, nomadic position. So in a sense, consciousness itself and freedom of Geist um, re reflects that um, uh, um, nomadology, as you use the word. You use the word Geist, yeah? Did you say Geist? Yes, I did too. To I mean, I think that's, a, that's such a big difference between Hillman and Bolas, you know, because Hillman has soul and spirit, and, uh, and they, they're kind of in some kind of relationship. Um, I try this idea out on you. I mean, what I'm not sure. I, I've been wondering recently whether <clears throat> the schizoid, you know, what we call schizoid phenomena and so on, is basically about spirit. That it's, uh, and uh, so people have problems with uh, when spirit is impacting them or impinging on them. So they, they might develop, you know, what we might call some schizoid pathology or something. But I wondered if, if they were able to uh, process it more in terms of spirit in some way, that it might not be so difficult for them. Um, so I was supposed to give some comments about somebody's paper on uh, schizoid defenses. So I was wondering, well, um, I mean, schizoid is basically a bad word, right, in psychotherapy. Um, if you're schizoid, that's very naughty. But um, 
I wondered if there's a if there's a positive side to it, related somehow to the spirit. Yeah, I, I'm reading now this uh, uh, from France on alchemy, and there's a part uh, in that uh, in one chapter uh, when she says uh, that uh, schizoid uh, or uh, schizophrenic uh, uh, clients uh, that came to her, they told her all these stories, and she said there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't tell it to someone who's too rational and they will blame you for this. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so it's also this uh, collective part. Uh, how can we integrate that uh, sanity or we, we were talking uh, with my wife uh, about these kind of things like uh, in the past uh, uh, you know every village had some uh, you know uh, if i joke uh, uh, a village idiot but they somehow uh, embraced it and integrated it in uh, in the structure of the village so no one was uh, stigmatizing that child or you know uh, uh, or maybe you know they they were making fun or something but uh, nothing major happened it was a part of a community yeah? and and i think that comment from from france uh, about uh, 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 schizoid uh, you know uh, delusions or uh, fantasies and so on uh, she said they are okay you know as long as you keep them to yourself or you discuss them with someone who can uh, 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 digest them or integrate them yeah? well that seems to be the main uh, the main issue can we integrate these splits or these uh, you know fractures in the psyche so the notion of geist um, is at least in hegel's system is all about the notion of splitting and projective identification and that that's on a you know you're projecting split off aspects of, of, of the mind into nature into you know culture and you reuptake it. And in that dialectical process, you are kind of on an ascending ladder, but at the same time, um, that's on a higher kind of plane. There's always capabilities of the psyche for regression and withdrawal back. And, and, um, and hence that's what schiz the schizoid phenomenon is. It's, it's, constantly in a case of splitting, of withdrawal, of, of, of not integrating. And um, if you look at, if you look at just the, ba the basic structure of the mind, how could we not be, uh, we encounter identity and difference every second from consciousness of having to take in a, you know, an object in our perception it's already been mediated through all kinds of splitting mechanisms and then we incorporate these things back into our understanding um, but in the clinical sense of what david's bringing up working with schizoid uh, character uh, you know pathology is extremely difficult especially if there's a psychotic um, component to uh, to a person because they, and to use Klein's uh, analogies, there's always a paranoid element to it as well. Uh, that whether getting too close to someone, too intimate, is gonna lead to being devoured or the other has to be seen as, as radically different that they could hurt, hurt the person. So they have to keep people at a distance. So the notion of splitting there, I think is the main, the main thing. Well, I, I, have, I can't resist asking what you mean by splitting. So. Um, well, in a, in a, uh, in a non, well, you want to hear analytic sense or a non-analytic sense? Um, well, just, okay, I guess it, as I understand Jung, right, the psyche is uh, split and fragmented. So it's not like, the individual splits things, right? Things are already split and in uh, uh, 
complexes or archetypal things. I mean, that, that's, how, that's the situation we're in, where there's multiple <laughs> things going on. So there could be a splitting, which is more, I guess what you mean is where a splitting of the person's uh, mind or ego or whatever. whatever. I, um, but I guess I'm just wondering if there's what we experience as split might be a separate thing, if you see what I mean. Okay, so I, I agree with what you're saying that we're thrown into a divided self, divided psyche, divided world, so to speak. Everything is, uh, you know, either fractured up, carved up, uh, fluid processes that aren't integrated into some fixed whole. Uh, and that's where we find ourselves in. But at the same time, there are, in my mind, there are certain organizational aspects of our, let's say our unconscious ego that tries to impose order on, on our perceptual world and our experience of conscious experience of the world, um, whether they be a priori categories, uh, you know, a la Kant or or whether they be, um, uh, you know, a division between the collective unconscious and, and the personal. Um, but within that kind of fractured way of being, we're trying to seek integration. And at the same time, we have to, we, we split off things that don't fit into our immediate, um, you know, mode of integration. Uh, whether we dissociate these things because they're just too much out there, a multiplicity of objects to try to contend with. And so we have to try to find some order. Uh, and the, the, ba the basic operation is to cleave off things. That's what I kind of internally we're cleaving off in, the, in our mind, whether it be through the imagination, uh, to, to use Barbara's point, um, or in a real physical way, you know, you're withdrawing like the schizoid person from the world because that's dangerous. So I, I think that splitting could be maybe these, these micro movements uh, as, you're, as you're introducing the notion of process in, in the psyche. Uh, that helps, David. Then I can't resist a question to David. Uh, do you see dissociation and splitting as similar or different? I see dissociation as natural and normal. Okay. Um, I, but I think, and, and yeah, so the, it's how, how to relate to things that are different um, from, you, uh, from where you are. But I, I mean, that's, I guess, there are definitely people who have experienced the shattering of the personal I guess it's like Carl Shedd talks about the personal spirit doesn't he he makes a distinction between the personal spirit and the kind of self and uh, he's talking about people whose personal spirit has been shattered um, but um, I don't, I, 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 I flinch a bit when I hear splitting. Maybe that's because in London it, it carries such a big moral mm -hmm. weight. It's like in supervision, they're splitting, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're splitting. Um, and I don't find that a very helpful way to approach things. That's called Lito's the opposite view, a critical view of why XE splitting uh, should be um, 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 an absolute crime or an unforgettable, unforgivable mistake to make. Or why exactly it is demanded of an individual that one's consciousness should be at least to, um, to um, be able to maintain the claim at all times of being on top of things or being in command of things. Those are 
social pressures that uh, do a lot of harm perhaps are not in line with the actual social functioning of the individual. Well, in, you know, in the in the context of uh, psychopathology, yeah, I mean, splitting's you know just a technical term. Um, anybody who, you know, the classic is working with a borderline personality disorder. So you know, you've got extreme, you know, on, on the the opposite end of the continuum, you can be, you know, idealized and with the neurotic transference, they fall in love with you, and then you're a piece of shit down the road when you're working through uh, their inner conflicts uh, and developmental traumas. Uh, so that, that's where that's coming from, Dave. No, I understand that. It's just, um, I mean, it might just be because we live in the, the Kleinian Vatican here. So. I think uh, as a non-English, uh, you know, non-native English speaker, it's, uh, you know, isn't it a, a lay term for a, a schizoid a split personality? And uh, uh, I think it has to do also, you know, how uh, we perceive this. And uh, uh, I was thinking uh, of this uh, uh, when uh, Jung uh, went to uh, some African tribe or something, uh, and he said, uh, how do your uh, shamans uh, know that something is wrong with people? And they said, we know before they come to us. Yeah? Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, like that famous uh, Mexico story when he had, if we tell you all the secrets, then the, stop will, uh, the sun will stop uh, uh, traveling and so on. Uh, so, do, do you guys, uh, who obviously have more uh, clinical experience, do you think that this uh, schizoid uh, split or whatever you want to call it, is a sort of uh, coping mechanism uh, to uh, deal with this kind of sensory overload or uh, trauma, or uh, is it uh, just uh, our way to handle the unconscious content that keeps uh, flowing up? I guess splitting is, is thought of as a defense, isn't it? It's a defense. Um, I was really struck um, in the piece by the quote by Picasso. I thought it was great. And, um, and I, I did think it summed up perhaps what a lot of what Hilm was trying to talk about, about the idea of being able to access ourselves on all sorts of different levels so we could produce something from the child within us um, and also produce work from some, something that was perhaps a teenager within us. Uh, um, you know, the Picasso sort of says, I'm just me, you know, I'm always the same, but I'm working with different levels of myself. And I think that is perhaps talking more what we would call archetypally um, and that it is talking about how we can abandon that child that remains within us, that doesn't have to develop into a grown up, but that has a sort of personality and a life force and a complex, a child complex of, it, of its own. And I, I do agree with what's being said, although I tend to think you need both, but I, I think depth psychotherapy has become very maternalized. And I think it's a great shame that it all becomes then about develop, developmental stuff, which leaves out, you know, I've even heard therapists talking about their patients as their children, which I find appalling actually. Um, so I, I think there has been a movement that has led to a sort of maternalization of therapy, depth therapy, but I, I, I have a hope that we're moving a bit away from that now. I think Jung's work is being increasingly understood. I sort of have a sense of that. That makes a lot of sense, uh, Carol. And uh, um, myself, I'm, I'm always shying away from anything that is even vaguely about evolution. And I'm very uh, uh, keen to think in terms of cultivating
Well, that feels like the nurse again, doesn't it? That the nurse cultivates, the gardener cultivates, they're growing things. And, and I think also what we're, we're dealing with here tonight is also this thing between the real thing and perhaps not quite the real thing, what Bion would call K and minus K. So for me, when I'm looking at the imagination, I think that for me, there is a great difference between true imagination, what the alchemists would call true imagination, and a kind of fantasizing that takes nobody anywhere. Um, so that for me has always been quite important in my thinking. Yeah, I think I think I'll just say actually is you know during this yeah very interesting. So thank you very much for your contributions. But I, I just find my mind kind of just kind of working kind of over time really trying to maybe not not reconcile but trying to to see because I I think you know I, I I think it is it is important as well. I can I understand what Helen is saying, but well I understand a little bit the saying about the archetypal child, but I, I think the kind of you know the kind of those early relationships, I feel they are still important. They are still very important. So, so I think maybe what John and 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 Barbara said, I think the, the importance of of the, the imagination really, you know, as a way to 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 not to integrate, but to to think about way things in different ways. Yeah, I think it's that's I feel that's important. <clears throat> Yeah, I think uh, th this is uh, the most important, if I can say that uh, from the text for me, is this connection between imagination and creativity and also how Jung uh, perceived this, you know, to keep the inner ch child alive, like I said in the beginning, and basically keep playing and keep all those options open, you know. And I think for me as a painter, you know, this is crucial, you know, and like uh, you were quoting uh, Picasso, I was really touched by that example, especially because I'm not a huge fan of Picasso and I never was, you know, I, I think he was like a some kind of egomaniac and woman, <laughs> womanizer, pompous, uh, you know, and so on. I, uh, I also don't have special affinity to his work, if I'm honest, you know, I'm more to Vermeer and, you know, more classical stuff. But uh, I was thinking when David and uh, John were talking about uh, this uh, borderline uh, stuff, how many people did perceive uh, uh, William Blake as a sane or uh, or a schizoid in his time, you know, and how do we look at him now, you know, and how he was in contact with his creativity or inner child or uh, unconscious, you know. I think this link, what we perceive as a, what a child is, incomplete and needs to develop into something, what we perceive, and then, uh, you know, we meet so many adult people that want to express their creativity or, you know, uh, uh, fulfill their uh, role in life. But there is some hindrance and so on. And I think uh, imagination and creativity play a great role in this. You know, we, uh, of course, you can be creative also as a banker or a chemist uh, and you can be creative as a, a violinist or, a, or an artist, you know. So creativity can come into our lives uh, through different channels, you know, but it's, I think, very important aspect of our life. Well, it is interesting that, you know, comparing Blake and Jung's Red Book I mean, they were both in their own ways visionary artists. I mean, I don't think Jung was an artist in the way that Blake was, but it is interesting to compare the two and, um, and to see that they were able to go into psychic experiences that got them called mad by a lot of people. But I think that the work that they produce can hardly be called madness, but it certainly is the ability to express um, what, what Jung would call the collective levels of 
the un you know of unconscious process. I'm a great lover of Blake, so I I liked what you said about him. <laughs> I think there was some mention somewhere, uh, I, I don't know where, uh, I think I saw how uh, they used the example of uh, Blake, how he could uh, uh, integrate the, that content and still live productively because he was integrated in a family and society. He was never completely outcast. And then if you uh, see on the other uh, side of the spectrum, what happened to Nietzsche? Yeah. 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 Although Nietzsche could certainly go there in a profound way, couldn't he? But you're, you're right. And maybe that's what we're talking about, that actually there's something about taking on what Jung would call the archetype or the collective experience, but also that we are also children born of parents and we need to take that into consideration as well. And, and I think Blake had a pretty happy childhood. You know, he was really supported by his parents and there's no indication that he was badly treated. I mean, he nearly got beaten by his father one day when he came home and said he'd seen a, a, a tree full of angels, but his mother saved him. And, um, and certainly when it got to him going out to work, his father, you know, went out and looked for somebody who he, you know, would apprentice Blake and thus began his work as a, as an artist and a printmaker. So I, I think he was quite fortunate, but very similar really to Jung. I mean, a lot of time on his own as a child, walking in fields, getting into nature, feeling something that wasn't just everyday life. So he didn't have um, a lot of schooling. He was left to be schooled by his mother and, you know, they're were, they were very into Swedenborg and all of that area. So a lot of spiritual, but yeah, I don't think mad. I don't think mad. Whatever we mean by madness, I'm not sure myself what that is really. It would be a good thing to, to well, keep a critical eye on what we call madness, exactly how it is composed in terms of being dysfunctional or not adhering to social norms. The other thing that came across talking about Jung and Blake is that apparently the, for them the balance inner development and social adjustment was a rather weight towards inner development. That's why they developed a kind of freedom in themselves to uh, escape the conventional in the most uh, basic sense of the word. Mm -hmm. A question to, to everybody. Um, uh, did you ever have the sense when you were reading Hill, Hillman's um, uh, article that what, what child was, was perhaps maybe the transitional object? No. No. I mean, I think he talks about childhood, doesn't he? So childhood is like, yeah, it's a kind of um, zone of, of uh, history and experience. And uh, I don't think, I think uh, the, for me anyway, the transitional object is a personal object. You know, it's like my blanket. It's not, uh, um, yeah, I guess I was thinking about that when um, uh, when Hillman was talking about how the child is detached, you know, and becomes an. Uh, I'm not being very clear, but uh, it seemed not, uh, so not so much about the childhood part, but just that uh, uh, the child can be seen 
as oh, I, I remember he he uh, that was very sh uh, striking. He said he said like a penis, you know, it's detachable, uh, and so that's what made me think: is is there something about what Hillman is talking about in terms of the child? Uh, is that uh, perhaps the, what what uh, we could be um, uh, experiencing as the transitional object? Again, it's just a... You mean for adults, a child is a transitional object? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, maybe the archetype, maybe the archetype of child uh, is some, something similar to uh, the transitional object. It make, makes me think that people's children are self objects. Or yeah, yeah. yeah, I think it's. I think that's what it's making me think. I, I felt he was saying such a lot is put onto the child. You know, the child is made to be responsible to hold so much, but what we all need to do is to be able to hold our own state of childhood, and then to and then on top of that to 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 use our imagination so that we can hold our state of childhood. So I, I think, I mean, this is a bit Blakean really again, but I mean, Blake talked a lot about different states that we all have, but felt that imagination was freedom. It wasn't anything to do with the state. Um, it may then be that the grouping and the persona that we're now talking about are far more culturally determined then that there are that they should be actual archetypes in the sense of unmovable uh, beyond our um, our um, ability to group because that I would think think is a typical thing that I would um, uh, distinguish an archetype from um, a part of cultural vocabulary if you want or a, cu a cultural uh, idiom of uh, perception. David Miller, you know, he says that imagination is not something, it's just a, a space, a possibility for something to appear. It's not. So if you say somebody has a strong imagination, it doesn't mean they have any particular content in their mm -hmm. mind. It means they have a, uh, a capacity <laughs> for a kind of space. But I mean, Blake did tend to personalize these things as, as uh -huh. Jung did. So, I mean, for him, the imagination was Jesus Christ. And, you know, we crucify Christ every day. I mean, that's what he felt. But you're, you know, I agree with you, David. I mean, I don't think Blake was saying it was, you know. Um, I think we do, do tend to personify these things into kind of archetypal images. I think dreams do that. You can see that so clearly in dreams. But maybe the dream isn't that um, um, formal in its declarations. It's just taking material in order to tell a story. Mm. So mm -hmm. we shouldn't necessarily give everything we dream the weight or a kind of archetypal weight in that mm. sense. Well, everybody, thank you very much and uh, for coming along. Thank you for your contributions and um, hope to see you again. Bye for now. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay, bye, -bye. Thank you.